Orada Paub and welcome all to this event which marks the launch of Wrexham Glyndore Universities uh, and the ACE Hub Wales partnership to raise awareness of the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences. I'm Claire Taylor, Deputy Vice Chancellor and Professor of Education here at Wrexham Glyndore University and I'm delighted to be co-chairing this event today uh, with Joe Hopkins, Programme Director at Public Health Wales. And I'll ask Joe to say a few words in a moment, but uh, first just a few, uh, a few lines of uh, housekeeping. And uh, as people are kind of creeping into the event, people still arriving, uh, I'll just ruffle through some of the housekeeping uh, points now. So firstly, just a bit of a word about the format. Um, so the purpose is to launch, to launch our trace animation uh, and to provide an overview uh, around how it's been developed, uh, followed by a Q&A with our panellists. And I'll introduce you to our stellar panel uh, later on. We will be keeping cameras off for the event. We'd like anyone with questions to please put them in the chat and we'll get through as many as we can during the panellist discussion uh, and before and after as well. So cameras and microphones turned off, please. If you'd like to put your question in the chat in Welsh, please do so, uh, as we do have translation facilities in that chat. And I'm absolutely delighted that we have with us Deputy Minister for Health and Wellbeing, Lynn Neagle, with us to mark the launch of this partnership. Uh, and, um, and she will be able to share reflections uh, and learning from her point of view later on as well. Lynn is joining us until around noon. Great to see you, Lynn. Lynn thank you very much. Uh, when she has to uh, go to a, a ministerial meeting, but uh, Lynn will be taking um, part in as much of the discussion as possible. So this is an important part of our commitment to becoming the first trace informed University of Wales, which we're taking forward as part of our civic mission partnership strategy. And it's great to see so many of our partners uh, on the call today as well. This is also an international event. Uh, delighted that we have Ben uh, from um, UNICEF with us uh, live from New York. Uh, and you'll be introducing him a little bit later on as well as part of the panel. So just a final point for me, we, we are recording the morning session, uh, but we will be removing any names from the recording uh, so that it will remain anonymous going forwards. So I'd like to briefly hand over to Jo uh, for, to introduce herself as co-chair and perhaps just to say a couple of introductory words. Thank you, Jo. Thank you very much, Claire, and I'm absolutely delighted to be co-chairing this event with you this morning. Um, my name's Jo Hopkins. I've got a very long-winded title, which is Programme Director for Adverse Childhood Experiences, Criminal Justice and Violence Prevention at Public Health Wales. Uh, but as part of that, I also have uh, the role as Director of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Support Hub, which is uh, the area uh, that has been working with uh, Claire and her colleagues, who you'll meet uh, through the course of the event, to really think about how we take forward our collaboration around uh, ACEs and uh, a trauma-informed approach. So uh, this is a really exciting uh, day for us because I think what you're going to see today is the culmination of some really uh, important uh, thinking, development, but also I hope you see as well the, the, the strength of our partnership and collaboration with Wrexham Glendale University, uh, but also the wider partners who are involved. So thank you, Claire. I'm really delighted, as I say, and looking forward to all the contributions this morning. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Jo. Um, so I'm going to um, we're, we're going to get straight into this uh, because we've got an awful lot to get through in the next hour and a half or so. Uh, and I'm delighted that I'm going to be able to hand over now to uh, Vicky Jones, who is deputy leader of the ACE Hub Wales. And she's going to just give us a, a few minutes, five minutes or so, introducing the background and development of the partnership. Morning, Vicky, and thank you very much for joining us. Borida, good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure and honour to be here today. Um, and I'm also really delighted to be able to introduce the hub and our work and really provide the background and the context to this journey to really realising our bold ambition for Wales as a trauma and adverse childhood experience informed nation. So the A Support Hub, who I'm representing alongside Jo, is actually funded by Welsh Government and hosted by Public Health Wales. And our aim is to really create the right environment for large scale whole system change 
to prevent, mitigate and tackle ACEs and the significant impacts they can have on people's lives and their mental health. So ultimately, we want to not just break the cycle of ACEs, adversity and trauma, but also tackle the wider impact on challenges such as poverty, deprivation and the social and health inequalities these create. So we've been on this journey for some time, um, as some of you will know, because you've accompanied us on it, working with many sectors, really, such as kind of housing, youth services, criminal justice and crucially with education. And as some people will know, we're already well on our way to realising one of our key ambitions to ensure that every school in Wales is strong, inclusive and trauma informed, really helping children to flourish and have the best start in life. So to support this, we developed an ACE and trauma informed whole schools approach uh, to support the school environment to be ACE aware and to enable schools to confidently respond to trauma. But we know that education does not end at the school gate and therefore trauma and ACE trace informed approaches shouldn't end there either. Further and higher education are vital parts of the whole education system. So we were delighted when Glyndor University committed to being a flagship university and working with us to become the first trauma and ACE informed university in Wales as part of its wider civic mission work. And this commitment is really enabling us to test and evaluate our concept with a view to scaling this up to an all Wales approach. So actually, what does this look like then in practice? Well, we've been working with the university to really implement uh, the, our trauma and ACE uh, organisational toolkit to really support a whole trace university approach. And actually in devising this toolkit, we recognise that training was not enough alone to really enable the level of transformational change that we strive for. And its aim is really to embed a trace approach in the very fabric of the organisation through its leadership, through its service design and through its staff. And we've done a lot of work to really bring staff and students at the university along with us on this journey. But one of the things that we realised very early on was actually how we achieve and convey a meaningful understanding of what it is to be ACE and trauma informed. Because we know that this term is being used often and widely across Wales, but there's a real question about how widely understood this is and how this is being consistently applied. And this was also something that was concluded within the Welsh Government ACEs review report, which was published in, in March last year. So in simple terms, then, a trauma and ACE informed approach is something that anyone can take. It means recognising understanding that anyone could have experienced adversity and trauma and really promoting opportunities for well-being, healing and recovery. So a trace informed person understands that people are shaped by their life experiences. They can recognise the signs and behaviours of trauma and are able to respond with kindness and compassion by seeking to avoid re-traumatisation. And we know that people respond, we respond incredibly well when we feel safe, empowered, trusted and connected. And we can't underestimate the power and impact of that. So it's really from this position that this brilliant animation we're launching here today was born. And the idea really emerged as a kind of creative, innovative and engaging way to convey meaning, to help people understand that this is something that we can all do and therefore take ownership of their part on this journey. And Caroline will talk a little bit more um, shortly about how this was taken forward. But in working with Glyndor University, we also recognised its reach as an anchor institution and the vital link really between our trace work and the university's civic mission commitment to tackling social inequalities. So we thought really that there was the perfect synergy here to work in partnership and use the university's civic mission as an enabler and a bridge to embark on a trauma informed work across North Wales communities. And this also links to our work with the 2025 movement, which has a collective vision to tackle avoidable health inequalities across North Wales and brings together over 600 members from across housing, public health, local government, higher education and so on. And that's chaired by Claire Budden, who's kindly joining us uh, today on the panel. So all of this work has really culminated in building community resilience across North Wales and there's huge growth potential to really expand this project and move towards trauma and ACE informed communities using 2025 as a vehicle to create this change. 
The pandemic that we've all been living through over the last two years has shown us that this approach has never been more important. We've all experienced adversity, some of us trauma, but in very, very different ways. But despite this negative experience, we've also seen much progressive action. Communities have come together to support each other and shown huge resourcefulness. And these are strengths for us to really celebrate and harness. And this is a timely reminder that we can use this experience of collective trauma as an opportunity for transformation to enable a trauma informed uh, movement across Wales and beyond. And I really believe that the Navigating the Storm animation provides the platform for this, not only on a local and national level, but even a global level. So this is a really exciting time, I think, to put Wales on the map as leading the way as a trauma informed nation. So thank you for listening to me. Um, I will hand now back to Claire to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much. Vicky, thank you so much. And that was a, a fantastic overview of, of the, the ambition, the scale of the project, which is very, very exciting. And I know that's going to come through uh, even more as we go through the webinar this morning. So I'm going to hand straight over to um, Dr. Caroline Hughes. Uh, one of our associate deans here at the university and uh, very instrumental in terms of uh, being a key leader uh, within our organisation in terms of this project, who's just going to give us a, 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 a bit of an insight into the animation, which we will be coming on to soon, uh, and in particular the way in which this has been developed and co-produced. So welcome, Caroline, and over to you. Boradar Powell, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today and to provide a brief overview of how the animation has been developed. My role within the project has been to lead the academic input and to work across the university to develop and grow our approach to being trauma and ACE informed with colleagues, students and external partners. As Vicky's explained, our innovative collaboration is founded on the principles of co-production and we really embody the five ways of working set out in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Rex and Blindor University's core values are to be accessible, supportive, innovative and ambitious in what we seek to deliver, believing that there are no limits to learning in the context of our supportive community. In all that we seek to achieve, the part played by our students, staff and external partners, who together are the university, is crucial. Students are at the forefront of our work and with students as our partners in all that we do, and we look to them and their voice to help shape what we do and how we do it. With co-production at the core of this project, it was imperative that the animation was student-led and we are proud that the animation has been developed by our talented and highly skilled students. Tegan will share with you the inspiring story of how she developed the Navigating the Storm concept later. The idea to extend the reach and influence of Navigating the Storm by developing an animation, emerged from our open house for researchers and was fully embraced and supported throughout by our partners, the A Support Hub, as an accessible and engaging way to help people understand a trauma-informed approach. Working with our colleagues in art and design, we shaped a brief for students and hosted an open and fair competition. The narrative was shared and we asked students to pitch their ideas to a panel evaluating the pictures according to their alignment with the ethos and focus of what we're trying to do. This approach enabled us to involve our students to shape and interpret the narrative using different methods, materials and ideas to bring the concept to life. The animation involved with insight and flair from Hetty Barnes, who created the evocative illustrations that you will see in the animation, and with creativity and professional skills from Beth Spendel and Megan Anthony, who developed the illustrations into an animation. The background music was composed specifically for the animation, and our colleague Ellen Mai Nevith narrated Lanciot Louis The animation was coordinated and supported by our colleagues in art and design, Steve Jarvis, Sue Thornton and Adele Phillips, working alongside Tegan as the author of the work. I'd like to take a moment to thank all colleagues, students and the A Support Hub for their hard work, encouragement and enthusiasm in support of this project. We're very proud of this work as a catalyst for reframing our understanding and striking up a conversation about trauma and ACEs and what we can all do. We're looking forward to developing and implementing the TRACE project 
as we continue on our journey together to achieve long-term change and move towards a more compassionate and kinder society and to prevent and mitigate the impact of trauma and ACEs in our region. Deal Hamranda, thank you for listening. Dear Aunt Caroline, thank you very, very much indeed for that fantastic overview and, and really bringing out uh, that values based approach and the team approach in terms of how the work has been put together, which is great. And I'm sure we can explore that more later on as well. Well, I'm delighted that uh, I'm able to introduce to you our, our colleague, um, Tegan Briley Solis. Um, Tegan has been embedded within the Wrexham Glendor community for a long while now, Tegan, haven't we? we? We met quite a few years ago. So Tegan joined Wrexham Glendor as an undergraduate student, uh, continued with her studies, has been doing postgraduate study, doctoral study, and is now working with us, which is fantastic. Uh, and uh, Tegan's going to talk us through the, the, the overview and the thinking and the kind of philosophy behind the animation. Uh, and what kind of influenced the direction of travel uh, in, in, in which it was taken. So Tegan has been absolutely instrumental in leading this piece of work, um, really um, shaping the work. And I'm delighted, Tegan, that you're able to share your thoughts with us now. Over to you. Thank you, Claire. Borada, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for attending today uh, for the launch of Navigating the Storm. Um, the concept begins with a story, as such things often do. Uh, back in 2019, I had not long started my PhD journey and I had put forward my first abstract to present um, at a conference. The PhD I'm working on at the moment focuses on trauma informed approaches within youth justice service. So, of course, I needed to discuss trauma and how it uh, may influence an individual's responses, relationships and their feelings about themselves, others and the world around them. Although I felt really excited to present, I was also incredibly nervous. I started to think back to other conferences I'd attended and presenters who were absolutely inspirational and seemed to present effortless, effortlessly. And I just remember wishing that I could be more like that. And then I thought back again and remember on more than one occasion, the presenter actually disclosing that they were so nervous and panicking the whole time. They felt like a duck on water, seamlessly gliding, apparently effortlessly on the surface of the water, but actually paddling, paddling furiously out of sight. Of course, that wasn't obvious to the audience at all. And it made me think about how we all experience things so differently. We all feel things so differently. And that might depend on our previous experiences and our circumstances at the time. So it was the recognition for me that others do not just potentially see the world differently to us, but they experience it differently too. So I started to think of all the commonalities we share, other than being human, of course. And we all share, along with the planet we live on, a high makeup of water, and despite having that in common, we're all absolutely unique. When we think of different bodies of water that exist, oceans, rivers, streams, ponds, we'll all feel and experience those differently. The bodies of water also change depending on circumstances. A serene ocean will not always be serene. It might be dramatic or stormy and such things lay outside of our control. So water is what I based my 2019 presentation on. And since then, I've developed the concept based on a nautical theme, as you may have guessed, to explain trauma and how we can come to understand it. It conveys how working through a trauma informed lens can create meaningful connections and highlight one another's strengths. It also illustrates that becoming trauma informed and responding to trauma is a voyage that takes time, patience and gentle curiosity. This concept and the accompanying metaphors have continued to grow and have been transformed into the animation that you're going to see today. The animation gives examples of the vehicles which are based on experiences, relationships, socioeconomic status and self-identity. Vehicles which each of us may use to navigate our water and how these vehicles change through the life course. And again, that will be different for us all. We will all have started with different means. Perhaps some of us are rubber dinghy or some of us a cruise ship. There are three items we all, we all have on our navigation vehicles. I won't go into detail about them all, but they include distress flares to signal when we need help. Also an anchor of resilience, which will look and feel different to each one of us based on a number of components. And it's important to mention that it's not always possible or appropriate to rely on the anchor of resilience should some situations require the need to bear hardship instead. 
An individual should never be held accountable if they lack resilience or struggle to lift their anchor because it's dependent on things which fall outside of our control. The third item we all have are telescopes, and these can be fitted with a trauma-informed lens so that we may begin to understand others' journeys and the water that surrounds them, appreciating that their responses reflect what they have experienced. Some individuals, such as trauma therapists, will also have a kaleidoscope, which they can use when a specialist intervention is required. Beyond the animation, the concept has grown to include lighthouses. A lighthouse is a beacon of hope and represents safety to guide our boats through difficult situations. It lights the way ahead, empowering us to continue with our journey, however that may look, whilst remaining a constant source of reassurance that we can move forward where there is opportunity given to us and where guidance is received if needed. In this way, organisations can be represented as lighthouses, their effectiveness measured by the lens they apply. Organisations who understand and are responsive to trauma have worked to apply a lens which enables them to undertake the various transformations needed at multiple levels, whilst constantly reflecting on their mission, values and work to ensure a nurturing, sensitive service is felt for all. In this way, their lighthouse lens can be likened to a Fresnel lens, which comprises of tiers of prisms, which refract and then reflect the light as it passes through, creating a brighter beam. The tiers of prisms represent the importance of multi-level change throughout the whole system, while the reflection of light symbolises the need for organisations to continually reflect, learn and grow. I hope that the animation conveys the importance of connections and relationships in all of their wonderful forms. I also hope that it helps with the understanding of trauma and what it means to be trauma informed, that you are understood and you are not alone. However you feel or want to feel, you will be met there with kindness and receptiveness. The important lies not in knowing exactly what an individual has experienced, but in understanding that there may be a history of trauma which may influence their life in a number of ways. It is acknowledging that there is strength in experience and just because there may be a cracked or gnarled tile, it does not make their life mosaic any less interesting or admirable. So as Caroline mentioned, the work of the illustration and the animation students and the support from staff at Glyndor University and the ACE Support Hub has been instrumental in breathing life into this concept. And I'm truly grateful to all of them for all of their hard work which has demonstrated their own individual understandings of the concept. There have been so many involved in this journey and I wanted to thank them also and hope they know how grateful I am for them and their steady support. Lastly, I just wanted to say that I hope you all enjoy the animation and please think if you can, as you're watching, what your water and navigation vehicle looks and feels like right now. And thank you once again for being here today. Tegan, thank you so much for that incredibly eloquent explanation of, 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 of what, why we're here today and, and what we're considering. And I love that challenge for us to start to think about our, our water navigation vehicle. So everybody, before we launch into the animation, just in a few minutes and, and, and a bit later on, have start to have a think about that. Uh, and that will help you to really um, you, you know, think about what it means to you personally. Uh, in terms of this incredible resource. Uh, delighted that Sophie Howe has been able to join us as well. Welcome, Sophie, and uh, we'll be um, welcoming Sophie to our panel discussion a little bit later on. But before we uh, move on to um, actually be able to view the animation, uh, before we actually launch it, um, I'd like to hand over to Lynn. Uh, to Lynn ne Neagle, the Deputy Minister. Just to be great, Lynn, if you could just share your thoughts around why you think this is important, perhaps a bit of an overview of the national context in terms of this work, uh, and um, yeah, th things that you think we need to know about, I guess, in terms of uh, the political and policy sphere as well. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good morning everyone um, and thank you to uh, Wrexham Glyndor University for inviting me to help launch Navigate in the Storm. It's a genuine honour to be here. I've been lucky enough to see a preview of the animation and I genuinely think it's absolutely wonderful uh, and a really brilliant resource to explain trauma in a way that is accessible and easy to understand for everyone. And I watched it again just before joining today and um, I was thinking about my own waters actually as I was 
was watching it and that certainly there was a great deal in it that resonated really strongly with with me and um, the things that I think are really important for us to address in Wales. Our childhood experiences, as we know, good and bad, shape us as adults and influence the lives we lead and they can influence our educational outcomes, economic prosperity, relationships with others and our physical and mental health and well-being throughout our life course. The Welsh Government is committed to ensuring that all children have the best possible start in life and the opportunity to achieve their potential. And we want our children to live long, happy, healthy, prosperous and fulfilling lives. And as we know, talking about our difficult childhood experiences, particularly those which are traumatic, can be challenging. We might find it, for example, find it hard to talk about what happened for fear of being judged. However, people's exposure to trauma and adversity may be more common than we think and indeed is more common than we think. And so people might be able to better relate, more able to relate to the experiences than we think. Research from Public Health Wales found almost half of the adult population in Wales had experienced one ACE. Fortunately, not everybody suffers long term consequences as a result. And that could be because they were resilient enough to cope or able to access support, both themes which are picked up really clearly in um, the animation. For some, however, exposure to traumatic childhood experiences will continue to have an impact on them for the rest of their lives. So we need, therefore, to improve people's awareness and understanding of trauma and its impact and how to recognise and respond to those affected by it. We must resist the idea that it is only specialist support services which can offer support to those affected. Of course, there'll be people who need long term specialist support, but we can all start simply by being kinder, more compassionate and more understanding to others. We can help make positive connections which can make a real difference. And that's one of my key takes from the animation. We know, too, that those who have experienced trauma can be less trusting of others, including services. The behaviour of others might make them relive their experience, feel helpless, frightened, cornered or powerless. And their responses might lead to services labelling them as difficult and curtailing or withdrawing of support. It is absolutely crucial, therefore, that we act in a way that is trauma informed and avoid re-traumatising those we are trying to help. Before Christmas, I met with the Children's Commissioner for Wales Youth Stakeholder Group and I listened to their, their views on the progress we are making on our whole system and no wrong door approach to children and young people's mental health and emotional well-being. What I heard loudly and clearly from them was the importance of adopting a trauma-informed approach to developing and delivering services. We know some children are especially vulnerable to mental health issues because of their early environment and circumstances. And we know that many children who develop mental health issues will go on to experience those issues in their adult life. That's why it's so crucial for us to take a trauma informed approach when developing services for young people, not only to understand their specific needs, but also to build their trust. And I would argue that we need to be looking at informing trauma informed services across the whole of our public services in Wales. Alongside our focus on prevention and early intervention, we're looking to prevent mental health issues from escalating within society as a whole. Our programme for government over the next five years includes a commitment to prioritise service redesign to improve protect prevention, tackle stigma and promote a no wrong door approach to mental health support. This is being is providing funding for Traumatic Stress Wales. I've been actively promoting the collaboration between the Children and Young People's Workstream and the ACE Support Hub in developing a trauma-informed approach and practice framework to support people affected by trauma. The framework will play an important role in the development of trauma-informed services across all sectors. So I'd like to wish you every success 
navigating the storm. I'm delighted you've made it available in a way that is easy to understand, especially for children and young people, and is very much like the approach we took when developing our Nest animations last year, which are available on YouTube for anybody who wants to take a look. I'd like to congratulate Tegan and um, all the students who worked with her on the animation and also to congratulate uh, Wrexham Glyndwr University for undertaking this pioneering work and their partnership with the ACES Hub. I wish you well on your journey to becoming the first trauma-informed university in Wales. This is a huge step forward and provides a benchmark for others to follow. Diolch Diolch, thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you very much indeed for your kind words and your unequivocal endorsement of this work, which, um, you know, clearly is influencing and has the potential to influence and support every corner of society. Um, and absolutely, I mean, you, you've endorsed that absolutely very clearly. And that idea of ensuring that we um, support uh, and embed that positive cycle of you know, removing stigma, um, kinder and more compassionate practice, understanding and trust. Really struck by what you said about trust there as well and how that can become um, can become a vicious circle, but can also become a, a positive cycle, can't it, if we get that right. So thank you, Lynn, for painting that picture and, and painting that ambition as well uh, for our nation, uh, which would be fantastic, wouldn't it, if we could embed this practice across all aspects of life and society. Thank you very much indeed, Lynn. And I know, Lynn, you're able to stay with us for a little while and we'll come back to you on the panel discussion in, in a few moments. So um, we're on to the main event, which is tremendously exciting. Uh, we are going to show you the um, Navigating the Storm animation in a moment. Um, the uh, animation uh, will be played through Teams. If there are any problems with that, then we'll also place the links in the chat. And we do have access to both Welsh and English versions, of course. So if you want to access uh, separately uh, the Welsh version or the English version, then they will be available to you. And then once we've um, shown the animation, then we'll head into our panel discussion. We are all navigating life, just like boats navigate water. When our life feels calm and manageable, the water gently laps the side of our boat. When life feels tough, the water is a stormy ocean with terrifying waves crashing all around. Some of us will be scared to face this storm, but manage to brace ourselves to do so, while others will feel anxious and may struggle to cope, fearing that one big wave could destroy them. As the storm passes, we focus on our recovery, but this is not always so simple. The experience of such an event may leave some to question their safety, anticipating another storm which will carry them out to sea again. The boat that we use to navigate the waters in life adjusts as we grow and our circumstances change. We might start life as a luxurious cruise liner, while others would compare themselves to a small sailboat or even a simple plank of wood. Each vessel is unique, based on experiences, relationships and self-identity. To the outside world, a boat can look worn. The boat may have a few leaks or a broken sail, but we may feel happy, content and safe on board. Another boat may look safe and sturdy, but there are various issues on board or below deck that can't be seen. The water can also be a treacherous place, and some of us may have found ourselves in predatory waters for some time. Even moving to safer, gentler waters, mistrust can prevail and some of us remain on guard. Our adverse reactions are often rooted in our previous experiences and remain difficult to ignore. After a challenging period, it is helpful to seek safety with a chance to be guided and supported by others and to rest and repair any damage. Without help to dock, we may be deprived of an opportunity to take time to revive our confidence and feel forced to remain in choppy waters, struggling to feel safe and lost without help. Distress flares equip our boats to save us. 
for they are only useful if we are able to recognise danger, know when to ask for help and know how to use them. They can also be misused with constant threats perceived in every situation and in a constant state of high alert. It is important to use our anchor of resilience which gives us control when things get tough, helps us to stay on course and learn from our experiences. It is not our fault if we struggle to use our anchors, we have little control over its weight. Our vessels are also equipped with a trauma-informed telescope. This allows us to look through a lens at an individual, their boat and the water surrounding them and begin to understand their own specific situation. Through this, we can connect and respond with kindness in a safe and trustworthy way. A collaborative, trauma-informed approach can teach us to recognise that each separate journey is unique. It is important to understand, however, that regardless of experience in adversity, we all have strengths and can go on to successfully navigate the storms that may come our way. Absolutely fantastic. I feel like we should be, uh, there should be a round of applause or, or something. I'll, I'll kind of virtually clap because that was actually really moving and um, I'm sure it landed in different ways for, for people on, on the call as well. Um, and I'm sure you'll want to look at that again and again and again. So you have the links now and uh, we'll be pushing that out into the public domain. Could I ask please for our, our panel members to um, uh, unmute and uh, reveal themselves by camera so we can get kind of set up here. So we've got Lynn and Sophie and Joe, we've got Claire Budden, Tegan, it's great, and Ben. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Well, we're going to move into a panel discussion just reflecting on some of the things that we've seen uh, and also some of the things that we've heard from our previous presenters. So we heard from Vicky giving an overview and also from Dr. Caroline Hughes um, from the university talking about how this is put together and, and obviously Tegan as well. Delighted that we have with us uh, Lynn Neagle, who we've already, already met. Thank you so much for staying with us, Lynn. Sophie Howe, who's joined us. Sophie, as we know, is the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Welcome, Sophie. Delighted that we have Ben Perks here, Head of Campaigns and Advocacy, uh, based in the UNICEF Global Headquarters in New York. So um, great to have you with us, Ben, and to bring a global perspective. Welcome back to Joe Hopkins, uh, Programme Director at Public Health Wales. Thank you, Joe. And also welcome to Claire Budden, who is Chief Executive at Cluid Allen Housing here in North Wales, and also Chair of the 2025 Movement, uh, which we did reference earlier, and uh, a significant partner with the University uh, in terms of our civic mission work. So thank you for joining us, Claire. And of course, Tegan Briley Solis, um, originator of the concept of navigating the storm, um, an absolutely um, key colleague now in terms of taking this work forward. So thank you again, Tegan, for, for joining us. So um, I'm going to go to each of you on the panel and, and just really ask for a kind of an, an initial reflection uh, on what you've seen and what you've heard. And, and in particular, I think, um, yeah, how, how does it relate to your particular sphere of interest, your particular role, your particular work. I think that would be a great point to start off. And um, Lynn, uh, I did tip you off earlier. We're going to start with you. So over to you, Lynn, for your initial reflections. Um, thank you very much, Claire. And um, it was brilliant to, to watch it again with everyone. I think it's an incredibly powerful 
um, and moving animation and I'm so pleased that I've had the opportunity to, to be here today and just congratulations again Tegan and, and, the, and the students who worked with you and to the university for being so forward thinking on this collaboration really. Um, I've had a long-standing interest in sort of attachment and relational issues um, since I've done some, some training in my constituency and that animation really summed up for me all the key aspects of what we need to be doing to uh, provide people with safety, connection and to address those difficult starts in life. So from my point of view, as someone that's really wanting to reform services for children and young people in Wales, it absolutely um, ticked all the boxes and really resonated with the work that we're, we're trying to do. I think it's got potential to take really complex concepts around relationships and attachment to a really wide audience in a really easy to communicate way, which is absolutely brilliant. And um, just to finish by saying that um, one of the things that I particularly resonated was the need to look through our um, trauma telescopic lens, really. And, um, you know, it's important that we all do that and we all carry on doing that because it's easy, isn't it? You know, as we're going through life to forget um, as good as we might be at trying not to forget. So I was thinking, yeah, definitely. I always need to remember that trauma telescope when I'm I'm thinking about the, making these decisions. So thank you so much. I genuinely think it's, it's a really wonderful, awesome animation that you've done. Congratulations. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you for being um, you know, so open and honest as well about how that's landed for you personally, as well as uh, as a resource for within the the policy development realm, which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Sophie, could I go to you next? Sophie Howe, who's our Future Generations Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you, um, Bordar Paub. I'm um, sorry, I'm just shouting out the side of my mouth to my husband. Can you get the dog? So um, excuse, um, excuse that. Um, so I think that the um, the animation was um, was brilliant. And I think what it helps to do is to give people that kind of light bulb um, moment of, you know, often the things that they're seeing in their professional life or indeed even their personal life. Um, and, you know, an explanation of, of the sort of impact that trauma has, um, you know, or potentially has across the board. Um, I sort of liken it. I had a, um, a real light bulb moment um, when uh, someone explained to me the concept of, of bandwidth. Um, and that's basically about, you know, there's often this sort of criticism um, around, well, why don't people make the right choices? You know, um, it's easier to buy health and it's cheaper to buy healthier food than it is to buy, um, you know, fast food. It's easier to do this than it is to do that. But the issue is if, you know, your mind is full of, um, you know, of trauma, of fear, of poverty, wondering how you might, um, you know, purchase your your next meal for you and your um, your family. And indeed, you know, some of the stats, um, you know, on that in particular um, are really sort of worrying. 54,000 food bank parcels went to children in Wales between April 2020 and March uh, 2021. 25 percent um, of parents living on low incomes in Wales report frequently skipping meals and feel that they have nothing left to cut back on. So if that's that immediate survival, or it could be that you're living in a situation of domestic abuse, um, and again, your immediate sort of survival is at threat, your bandwidth is full of survival. So making um, what might seem to be um, obvious uh, choices to your well-being and to your ongoing you know, health and so on, actually, it's not as simple um, as it seems. And I think that, you know, that explanation around we all um, weather the storm differently um, by, you know, the, the, the sort of the size of or the quality of or um, so on of our boats really um, starts to kind of explain that concept. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of taking a trauma informed um, model to you know, across public services in Wales is absolutely essential. My last job was in um, South Wales Police, 
um, where we led work around early intervention and, and ACEs. And actually, um, some of the things that we did there are things that all public services need to do. So at a time when uh, policing was experiencing the real brunt of cuts, and you know, I have to say that that's the difference between a UK government um, and a Welsh government. So we see that, you know, certainly in terms of those devolved Welsh public services, particularly local authorities, even during that period, you know, of austerity, um, you know, back ten years ago, we were protecting the Welsh government um, differently to the UK government was protecting those frontline services as best they could. Policing, on the other hand, non-devolved, taking horrendous. Um, cuts right up front during austerity. But we took a decision at that point, despite losing police officers, that we would take some of that budget for policing and we would invest it in health, in the health system, um, in the social care system and in education to, to develop early intervention um, models and a kind of trauma informed practice. Um, with those other public services, because what we recognised is that actually the vast majority um, of people who end up in our criminal justice system, so on the books of the police and the court service and the prison service um, and so on, are not bad people. They're sad people. They're people who have experienced trauma. So if we're ever going to get up front of that, actually, you know, the police are not really their essential, but they're not the answer to that. So we need to be re-diverting um, our funding elsewhere. And I think that there's, you know, very similar things across um, some of our devolved public services now. So health play an important part um, in the solution um, to, um, to tackling ACEs, but actually it might be better if we diverted some of that funding um, towards um, better intervention um, at an earlier stage rather than just um, sticking plasters and patching people up um, when, they're, when they're ill. In terms of the, um, the, the Future Generations Act, I think a trauma-informed model and a focus on the holistic um, set of kind of well-being measures is absolutely essential. So we know from the Public Health Wales ACE um, research that kind of, you know, where you live, the circumstances in which you live um, either provide, you know, add to the trauma um, or can provide a kind of protective factor. So, you know, we need to be looking at things like if you uh, live in a poorer community, you're more likely um, to be living in um, areas of high air pollution. You're less likely to have access uh, to green space. Those sorts of things, um, access to green space in particular, really good for people's um, mental health and well-being. We really need to be making these connections and joining the dots. And I think that there's a, a huge range of initiatives that the Welsh Government should rightly be proud of, particularly the kind of, you know, trying as best they can to protect from, uh, funding uh, for frontline and early intervention services. But I would really like, you know, on the training that's happened to make ACE aware, um, ACE awareness training um, across sort of public services. I was just looking back to my future generations report, um, some, you know, questions we asked of public services back in 2018 and 27 out of 33 public bodies covered by the Future Generations Act then um, told me that they were delivering training in, um, on ACE awareness to, um, to their staff. That is not something that has been happening um, in England. Indeed, the, you know, believe it or not, the UK Science and Technology Committee um, looked at this issue and actually recommended that the UK government should follow um, the sort of prioritisation around ACEs that Wales and Scotland have had. But I think we need to go a whole load further. I think, you know, it's going to be incredibly difficult now with the increased demand, the increased trauma, the increased um, numbers of children on the child protection register, domestic abuse incidents and so on that have happened during COVID. Um, but COVID has also exposed a real need for us to tackle those inequalities. And I think tackling, you know, taking a trauma informed approach and tackling ACEs is part of doing that job. But we do need some brave decisions from politicians about redirecting funding even further towards those preventative services. Oh, thank you, Sophie. So a clear ask there, um, put, put out there, which is which is fantastic and um, really struck about the points you made. And we've had some comments in the chat as well around that idea of joining the dots, connecting, being smarter about um, some of that sort of you know, partnership type engagement. And that may well be a, perhaps something we could unpack a little bit more later on when we've once we've heard from everybody on the panel. But thank you very much, Sophie, for those um, comments and provocations, always good, always good. Um, ben, could I come to you? Delighted to have with us Ben Perks, who's 
joined us from uh, UNICEF Global Headquarters in New York, where he is Head of Campaigns and Advocacy. Welcome, Ben. What are your thoughts today? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. And I want to congratulate you and Joanne and Tegan for this uh, amazing initiative and this fabulous animation. I am sure it's going to be translated and used in other countries as well. What you're doing today is very much part of almost a global awakening and a global movement around adverse childhood experiences. Uh, you have an ACE study in uh, in in um, Wales, which is informing policy, but it's important to know that in over 30 countries around the world, there's also been ACE studies, and they broadly, and this is amazing, they broadly show the same level of prevalence and the same level of correlation with poor life outcomes. So across continents, we see prevalence of between 50 and 70 percent of populations having one ACE and between 10 and 20 percent of populations having four or more. We see the correlation with poor life outcomes, a dose response correlation amongst almost every single well-being indicator. I think we can safely say that we believe in the United Nations that um, that ACEs are the primary preventable cause of poor mental health potentially addiction or a major contributor to addiction and obesity and also uh, major contributors to poor physical health, violence. The data that you have done in Wales on violence is very important to the global uh, narrative and has been groundbreaking and all of the other um, all of the other negative outcomes associated with um, ACEs. Uh, as you know, we think that ACEs are transmitted primarily intergenerationally often unintentionally, often not in chaos, not always in chaos filled homes, but just with uh, homes that, that lack a sense of love or a sense of belonging. You know, the children, the children's safety is not just the absence of violence, but it's the presence of love and connection. We know that love and connection and a strong parental attachment is the principal protective factor in the lives of children. In the UN, uh, principally WHO, UNICEF and the UN Secretary General's Special Rep on Prevention of Violence Against Children have committed to end ACEs, um, which is new and a, uh, and a real a real breakthrough. And we're working uh, around the world to, to, to do this. And there are three key interventions that we're prioritizing. The first one is universal access to parenting. Looking back to the 1980s, when we dramatically reduced child mortality by making vaccines globally available and other public health solutions. Now taking an epidemiological approach to prevention of ACEs through having uh, parenting programs universally available. The second thing is about, and this is very relevant to your story here today, is about making sure that communities and schools make sure that children have a sense of belonging and connection, that they are safe, seen, soothed and safe, because this disrupts the intergenerational cycle of trauma and it is something that helps children to recover. So for children where we, for where we can't prevent it, we can at least do our best to help those children recover. And the third thing is to break up the taboo on uh, adverse childhood experiences. Given the prevalence, we should be talking about it much more. It, it's, it's an urgent issue in, 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 uh, in North America and Europe alone. We lose 1.3 trillion uh, the US dollars to so the health costs alone of ACEs. So even for people that don't care about human rights, about children, about, um, about child well-being, there's an economic imperative to address them and we have to take uh, that up. Uh, just to say that Wales is a global leader on this. I don't know if you know that, but you are way ahead of most countries on the planet. You should be very proud of that. And obviously, Wrexham, and I apologize for my pronunciation, Glyndebourg University is taking a massive lead uh, in that process. Um, I just want to say on that, there's no such thing as a trauma neutral environment, right? An environment either exacerbates trauma or it soothes it and helps to address it. Um, you know, and, and I think that in your, you know, I gave that statistic at the beginning about the prevalence of ACEs. It broadly means if we take 15 percent as the average number of adults with four ACEs in a seminar room of 30 uh, students, five of them are in that very serious position of having had five ACEs and others, different levels of ACEs. Five, sorry, having four ACEs or more. 
Uh, that's the prevalence. There are children, young people coming to your university that have never in their life felt like they're loved. And that prevents them from flourishing and from meeting that potential. But it doesn't need to be like that because you can make a difference to that. You can make every child feel like they belong, every young person feel like they belong. And I think this initiative that you're doing today is, uh, is part of that. And I hope you set the outcome of having no child or no young person in your university that doesn't have a sense of belonging and healthy connection. That would be a good outcome. Thank you very much and sorry for going a little bit over time. Ben, uh, please don't apologise because what you've uh, told us is, is rich and insightful and is really um, contributing to the debate, which is absolutely fantastic. And, and the points you've made there around, you know, the, the twin track of um, sort of structural investment policy decisions, but also, you know, dialogue, you know, removing those taboos, creating space to talk openly, uh, that shared language um, that we talked about earlier as well. And thank you as well, Ben, for acknowledging that um, here in a corner of North Wales, we're global leaders. Uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And um, we're, we're really proud to be involved in this work. And it's great to hear that uh, objectively uh, f f from you over there in New York. Thank you very much. OK, we need to move on. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go to Joe next. Joe Hopkins um, from Public Health Wales. What are your reflections, Joe? Thank you, Claire. Thanks very much. And, and coming after Lynn, Sophie and, and Ben, um, <laughs> I feel slightly overwhelmed, but I just wanted to start with, because um, I thought Lynn might have to go before I, I spoke, um, a, a huge thank you to, to Lynn personally for the support that she's given uh, the agenda, the conversation, and in particular the animation, because uh, without the work that she led through the Children and Young People's Committee, uh, without the conversations that we've been able to have with her, which have been very honest and open, um, it's really helped us to, to shape and, uh, our thinking. So, so many thanks to Jocelyn. Uh, and similar, Sophie and Ben. Uh, Sophie has been at the forefront of these conversations for many years. Um, always a, a, a honest and uh, candid challenge to to the work that we do, and that's very much appreciated. And Ben, of course, we watch uh, from here the work that you that you've been leading, the blogs that you you put out. Um, they're really inspiring, uh, and I think you know again helps us to to remind ourselves how important this work is uh, and what we're doing. Um, I think in terms of reflections on on the actual animation, when I first saw it, I burst into tears. Um, and I'm not very good at these things because I keep doing this. I think it might be my age. I have no idea. But when I've seen this again today, for probably the umpteenth time, it has the same emotional impact on me. It has that kind of, it's so beautiful. It conveys the message in a way that, that I understand, but I think my, my 10 year old son will understand. And that's really important because I think the, the reach of this, the potential of this for, for getting a message across to professionals, uh, to parents, but also to children and young people themselves, the, the kind of the way that you can take what you what you need to know from it at so many different levels. I think it just really struck me again when I saw it uh, just now, how, how powerful and emotional it is. And I'm not ashamed to admit I'm crying all over the place because I think that's a that's a really positive reaction. It's, it's, a, in a, it's something that, that really kind of pulls at your heartstrings and says to me, we are doing the right thing. And this is a, a huge part of it. I think overall, um, one of the things that, that the uh, Ace Support Hub, uh, I think we mentioned earlier, in the work that we're trying to do on the um, uh, developing a Wales national uh, framework for, for trauma is to really kind of get behind what do people understand by the words, the terminology trauma informed, because one of the things that, that's been really apparent to us in our work is that actually uh, there's a huge amount of tremendous work going on across Wales, but not everybody is using the same definition. Not everybody quite understands uh, what we mean. And, and sometimes, depending on your background, it can mean very different things. Um, one of the, the reasons that we are uh, so pleased to be doing the work that we are with Traumatic Stress Wales is that one of the kind of uh, barriers that we found to some of the conversations is that understanding that there is this more universal uh, approach that there's something that anyone can do it doesn't just sit in the specialist clinical 
um, mental health pathways or with people with, with exceptionally long uh, <laughs> uh, degrees and currencies under the name. Actually, there is a, a windscreen here, a place that we can all uh, make a difference. And I think the thing for me that has been missing is that very clear articulation for everybody, regardless of where you are, um, of, of what it is we are talking about. But distilling it down to the language that, that, that has been used, but we've also used in this conversation words like um, love, compassion, friendship, connection, you know, the things that, that really are the bedrock of, of, of how um, many of us have overcome adversity in our lives uh, because we have those things, because we're enabled uh, uh, to, to kind of reach out for that support. Uh, and the point around those people who have to make those difficult choices around perhaps, you know, feeding their family or doing something else because that, you know, that is their survival. That's the life that, that they're having to, to manage at the moment. I think that as well is the bit we need to also understand about that poverty of opportunity to be able to to obtain some of these things. We call them protective factors, but actually they're just the things, aren't they, that help us to get through life. Um, so thinking about what what it is that we can support in terms of those people who are marginalised and continue to be marginalised from society, um, how do we enable that to happen? So when we're thinking about our students, when we're thinking about our staff, how does it feel to be uh, uh, someone who has experienced racism and discrimination day in, day out through their lives? How does that impact on them? That has a traumatic uh, effect uh, that may or may not be something that goes on to have negative health and other consequences for them. But if we have the right uh, understanding around that, then we hopefully can can recognise that and, and start to to make sure that what is offered includes everyone's experiences, not just you know, the 10 um, ACEs that, that are documented in the research. I think in terms of, of thoughts on how it can be used, I think uh, the point about that I'd love, to, I have shown it, I have to admit, uh, to my 10 year old son, um, but it's not just me. Uh, when we uh, have talked about this within Public Health Wales, uh, one of our more junior members of staff said, oh, I'd love to show that to my child. I think that's really important. So it is about, you know, we could think about a huge range of opportunities to, 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 to get this out there, to support work that's already going on. So, for example, we've already mentioned the Nest NIF model. There's some wonderful stuff that's come alongside that. But I think this is a really complementary piece that could could support that 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 ongoing uh, narrative in the in the bigger picture. Um, but overall, I think the biggest contribution that this makes is not only to showcase that that they are we have pioneers in Wales that are continuing to lead the way, are continuing to look for new, exciting, innovative ways to engage uh, the whole of our society uh, on this subject, but also uh, that enables us to to think differently and to have that consistency, that language that brings us together, that shared purpose, so that we can uh, move forward uh, with something that is, is truly wonderful. And I just wanted to end by saying how how lovely it is to have something produced by the students themselves with Tegan's expert guidance. This, you know, this had nothing to do with us, actually. It was all to do with them. So surely then that's going to land in the best possible way uh, for the people that we're, we're trying to reach. So thanks ever so much. Thank you, Joe, for those reflections and for reminding us again of, of the power and emotion of, of, of that animation. And I think, you know, when, when it finished, just, you know, just earlier when we showed it, there was a little bit of a quiet moment, wasn't there, where I think we were all kind of just taking a bit of a breath and thinking, yeah, there's, there's something very deep and powerful here for us to take notice of. And I love the fact that you're referencing the fact that this, this is a resource potentially can just cut through, you know, barriers of, age or location or professional understanding uh, that kind of accessibility obviously is really important to us and, and thank you again for referencing the fact that this is this is pioneering work um, so I'd like to invite Claire Budden to uh, to share her reflections now Claire Budden is a great friend of the university um, CEO at uh, Clwyd Allen Housing here in North Wales chair of the 2025 movement and a key partner uh, with the university's civic mission partnership work Claire welcome what, what are your thoughts this morning Dear Claire, I mean, firstly, just bend a to Tegan and everybody that's been involved in developing the animation. It really is fantastic. Um, and I, I've had a little peek preview before today. And like Joe, it it is an animation which is effect, which affects me emotionally too. I have to say, but it's so good at getting the message across. And what I really like about it is that the, the use of the words trauma and ace informed and lens. 
um, is hardly mentioned. So the language in it is very simple and straightforward. And I think that's what will make this animation so powerful as it's rolled out everywhere. I can see it resonating with our residents, with our staff and with our communities much more broadly. Um, I'm going to be a little bit pragmatic here and just tell you a little bit about Clwyd Allen's journey around trauma informed because I think that's really relevant um, to where we are today. So we're a housing association, we employ 750 staff, we deliver services to about 15,000 people across North Wales and we have a range of services including about 15 homeless um, services for the street homeless, hostels, we have uh, care homes. So we work with some of the most vulnerable people across our communities. And we've got three simple values, which actually they weren't, but could all almost have been written through this lens. And they are trust, kindness and hope. And they inform how we work with each other as colleagues and how we work with our residents day in, day out. And they really drive our trauma-informed approach and work at Clwyd Allen. So, um, we pride ourselves on employing lots of our staff who have lived experience of the services that we provide. And of course, that provides huge value because our staff really get the circumstances and the situations that our residents find themselves in. But that also can mean that some of the work issues that those staff have to deal with each day can trigger previous experiences and previous challenges that those people have had to deal with in their own lives. And what we've been doing over the last few years is making sure that we are much, much better at supporting the well-being of our staff who can access a whole host of services, conversations, guidance, whatever people need. We've got much better at reviewing situations and talking them through afterwards, whether they're experiences that staff have shared with residents or with each other or just some of the real day to day challenges. And what we're making sure is that we learn from those situations about how we work with colleagues and how we work with residents. Where that's led us to is we have a really big campaign going on internally about not having any staff disciplinaries, not having any staff grievances, not having any staff conduct investigations, because we believe that people come to work intending to do a good job and sometimes stuff gets in the way. So we ask why now? Why has that happened? And what could we do to resolve that situation and help that person? So we don't have prescriptive people policies anymore. You can imagine Elaine, our HR director, is on the call, actually, when we first started talking about taking away the policies and putting them in the bin. Um, but the transformation we've seen inside the organisation now where we just provide guidance for our staff because we're all grown ups um, and we want to have open and trusting relationships with each other. How that transforms into our communities also is that we have a policy of not evicting any of our tenants. We've ripped up the, the word antisocial behaviour. It's like a swear word now in the organisation because we ask ourselves, why would a tenant intentionally do something that might threaten their home? They wouldn't, would they? So when problems happen with neighbours, why? Why has there been a problem that's arisen with next door? And what can we do to support people so they can keep their homes and their tenancies? We're talking a lot with our residents about this change of approach and I can really see the animation helping us to simplify and bring what we mean by this approach to life for everybody. So fantastic to be here today and thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, and, and for, for sharing those insights there around the work that you're doing. And uh, I love that, that moving away from passing judgment, making assumptions um, to actually taking a taking a pause taking a breath and asking why and you're right i mean that animation is going to be a great resource isn't it for you to use um across your staff body and also with your with your tenants as well so thank you for sharing those reflections and thank you for your ongoing work with us and, and for your support claire um i'd like to move to tegan now and um tegan in in particular um i mean you've you've been embedded in this work from the very beginning uh you, we, we, we know that you're passionate about this work. What are your thoughts around you know, the next steps here? How do we take this forward? Well, I think um, for the animation, I'm, I would be really happy for it to be shared widely and used in a variety of ways, not just with um, children, although that's work, that is very important. Um, but it's understanding that actually trauma and adversity can happen at any stage in the life course. 
um, and can influence a person's uh, responses and reactions. So um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that it will help to, to embed a cultural thoughtfulness, which then underpins organisations um, and change can happen at every level where every single person feels that they have the potential to make somebody else's life a little bit better. And it's in those organic conversations often um, that we can make people's lives a little bit better. Um, and it doesn't matter where in our professional life or in our personal life, um, that's where we can make a change or plant a seed in somebody's head that actually they are worthwhile and they have so many strengths. Um, and that's the other, other thing really is um, for the animation to um, portray the need to take a strengths-based approach because trauma and adversity isn't the entire makeup of an identity. It's just, as I say at the beginning, one or small, uh, one or two small tiles on their whole mosaic of life. Um, it's not that to say that it's not important and it ha can have a great impact on us because it can, but it's about thinking people are more than what's happened to them. They have more to their identity. Um, and we don't often know, as the animation um, hopefully um, depicts with the different boats, sometimes it can look like somebody has the most amazing boat and they're sailing through life without a care in the world, but actually there's there's lots of stuff going on um, below deck that we have no idea about. Uh, and likewise, it might look like somebody has uh, maybe, you know, not the greatest boat to see them through a storm, but they are really, uh, really um, able to manage that storm and weather that storm well and feel content on board. And it's also, um, I think that one of the biggest um, things for me is uh, relationships and how important relationships are. So building strong and positive relationships with individuals in personal and professional life, which do include compassion, trust and love. And that might take time and patience. Um, and overall, though, once we give that the time and patience and the nurture that it requires, it will hopefully help to form strong connections and foster a sense of belonging, which is incredibly important. And again, um, hopefully uh, within the animation, um, the part about the predatory waters, uh, it might be when we are trying to form a positive relationship with somebody that they might not react very well to that at first. It might take time and patience to that, but it's about understanding why, because they may have been in predatory waters. They may not know um, that good relationships exist and good connections exist. And so even when a good connection is there for them or um, a good relationship, the seed is starting to be built, actually they might react adverse, um, adversely at first um, and it's about ne never giving up on them and um, keep going with them because they're absolutely worth it. Thank you Tegan for that really honest reflection and uh, I, I know you're going to be engaged in this work going forward so we're not going to let you go um, and uh, really looking forward to seeing it develop and I love that phrase you use around developing um, a culture of thoughtfulness at every level um, I I'm going to take that away and, and steal it and, and uh, try do something with that, I think. And we've also heard a lot about compassion. And um, uh, Sharon, uh, one of our colleagues at, at the university, has just flagged in the chat uh, the work that our um, health and wellbeing team, that's our academic team, so we run a health and wellbeing um, degree programme, uh, are, are doing some research into that. So if you want to check that out and connect in with Sharon, then that would be a great thing to do. We've got seven or eight minutes left. I can't believe how quickly the time has gone, uh, but it's been really fantastic to hear from each of our panel contributors. And Lynn has now um, had, to, had to leave us, but we've got uh, we've got a little bit of time left. And a question that is coming up um, in slightly different ways in the chat, but I think there's a bit of a theme here, is around you know that kind of scaling up question. Uh, how do we engage partners and create a sense of common purpose? How do we create that? unified movement of change and how do we bring a consistent approach across Wales uh, that is truly going to make a difference and transform lives now these are big big questions and I'm not expecting panel members to give me the answer although that would be great um, but I would be interested in reflections in terms of the sorts of things that we might need to start to think think about to, to kind of make that next step change in terms of of, of scale and scaling up. 
And I wonder, I'm going to put Ben on the spot here um, and uh, come to you, Ben, as, as a kind of objective, you know, outsider, ob observer looking in. What are your thoughts on how we might be able to achieve that? D just a couple of minutes reflections, please. I think it's really important to focus on what we would call the accelerators, which are the interventions you're going to do that are going to impact the, more, the, the, the widest number of goals in reducing and addressing ACEs and preventing and responding to trauma. For us, when, because we do human rights diplomacy with governments all around the world about this, and we, we, we've identified parenting programs, um, connected schools which are supportive and help kids uh, have a sense of belonging, breaking the taboo. And fourthly, rethinking the investment case, because, uh, you know, the, the Chicago University Nobel Prize winning economist says that every dollar we invest in early childhood development to prevent things like ACEs, we get a very high return on investment. And often when governments do budgets, they don't take that into account, the cost of ACEs. So I think a lot of... Uh, you know, you should be working with your economics department to to build up advocacy cases that support the policy changes that you want to promote as well. And then making sure in your own community that everybody's connected and you have a culture of thoughtfulness, which I love and I'm going to use. Uh, yeah, those are some thoughts. Thank you very much, Ben. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Joe, what, what are your thoughts on this as, as a key key leader in this space? Thanks, Claire. Um, I think Tegan ought to take out a patent on the culture of thoughtfulness, just in case. Um, no, I was, I was actually going to, to mention that something came back to me that, that Sophie said at a different meeting. And forgive me, Sophie, for, for paraphrasing you. Um, but Sophie said, uh, we've got to stop tinkering around the edges. And I think for me, this is about whole systems change, isn't it? We've we've done some brilliant things, lots of fantastic initiatives, um, which when you put them all together, they pre present a really fantastic picture. And I think if, if Lynn was still here, she would remind us that, that this year the, the Welsh Government are going to be publishing their ACES policy plan. Um, and that, you know, there are things in train that, that hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see that that reintroduction of that leadership at a political level but actually there's some really big society things that we need to be thinking about here that enable us to really say can our organizations be truly trauma informed if they're still encountering those same barriers that they've been facing you know from for many many years you know we, we talk often about you know changing the culture or looking at you know an organizational response and Claire's organization is a fantastic example of how I think it can be done but where you've got entrenched uh, ways of working entrenched policy and procedures where people are given five minutes to do uh, their bit of the job and actually you know if they really needed to sit down to show that connection to build that relationship they need a lot longer how do we take away some of those systemic um, uh, barriers that have evolved over time uh, to really allow us to, to do this. And I think one of, the, one of the phrases that I used in a in a slightly different context actually was around um, violence against women, was that when we were talking about the experience of COVID uh, and the green spaces element and, you know, what, what do we need to do? All these people who live in, in tall blocks of flats that can't get out, you know, for their daily half an hour of exercise, Oh, well, let's why don't we think about building balconies? Now, I'm not going to say you know anything about building balconies, but the, the kind of reference, the metaphor there was. So what is the balconies then that we need to build for some of these big questions? What are the things that we need to really think about that overcome some of these issues? There's been a huge amount of work on, on systems thinking and all the rest of it, but it's a huge amount of work. Now we need to be saying, what do we need to put in practically that makes the fundamental difference to people's lives? So. I think things like the animation, things like the work that you're doing at Wrexham Vindor, things like the reminders that Sophie and Ben give us uh, around, you know, there are some big policy questions here, big economic questions here. And then we get the experience on the ground from, from Claire and others that say, look, you know, here is here is an organisation that's really trying to do it. And we've really got some ideas. And, and how do we bring all this together? So the buzzword really is community of practice, isn't it? But actually what, what this means is let's all pull in the same direction. It's got to be about prevention. It's got to be a cross ministerial cross party commitment to doing this and i think you know there are uh, some really fantastic people in wales at the moment all driving in that same direction if we can continue to do that and if we can continue to recognize that some of the things we are doing is tinkering around the edges uh, let's then use that collective 
harness that collective power and passion which has come through from today you know from tegan just listening to you i can feel it you know how do we how do we get that uh into the conversations we have in government we'll we'll, we'll give it a good go i think is the uh, is the best i can offer today thank you joe very much indeed um claire claire, claire, claire Budden, um responses to what joe or ben have, what ben or joe have said I mean, I mean, I I agree with the things I'm hearing. I guess for me, um, at a national level, we've really got to address poverty. You know, that's got to be in terms of prevention. We've got to get to a stage where no children are being brought up in poverty. You know, so that's that's a biggie for me. And those of you that know me won't won't be surprised for me to say that. I think the other thing I'd say to everybody on this call today is sometimes you do have to start small as well. So Joe and Ben have talked about the big strategic things, but we also need to think about our own behaviours every single day. Um, don't put people in boxes. When you see a behaviour or a reaction to something that jars with you, think about why, ask yourself why somebody's reacting in that way. And I think if we can be working at, I guess, the most strategic level in governments and with each other as sectors, both public, private, voluntary, but also every single one of us. You know, there's 70 people on this call today. If we all start to behave differently all the time from today, then those ripples will also start to grow. So we can do it organically, bottom up, as well as um, thinking strategically about our policies and the way we work at government level. Thank you very much, Claire. That's a really good reminder. Um, yeah, every single person on this call, let's think about ourselves as change agents uh, because, you know, we've we've seen this animation. We've heard what's been said. Each one of us could do something even today that might make a difference uh, to somebody in our home, in our office, uh, wherever it might be. Thank you for the, that reminder, Claire. Um, Sophie, I'm going to come to you just in a moment for some final reflections, but I'd like to hear uh, from Tegan um, again, sort of final words from you, Tegan, in terms of today or, or anything else that you've heard. Uh, yeah, again, same as Claire, I, I um, agree with the conversations that are coming out and I, I think that there's some really important um, themes that are coming out like poverty, inequality, all of which um, a huge part of um, trauma and being trauma informed. And I think for organisations, um, it is a voyage and it's not simply ticking a box um, and saying, yes, we've done it, we, we're finally trauma informed. It is about reflecting continuously because things change every day for people. And um, if we are looking at inequalities, that changes too. So we need to be, um, again, thoughtful and um, remind ourselves that we should, it is a reflective journey. Uh, we've all got access to our lenses, um, but actually organisationally, we've got our for now lenses in the lighthouses um, that can can empower people to move forward with their, with their lives and their um, journeys and help people to heal um, and recover from um, some of their trauma um, in a place where they can and feel able to move on. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone um, for being part of the panel and to Claire and Joe for chairing. It's been such a great pleasure to show the animation today and to share, share the work with you all. And I really hope that you can use it uh, wherever you, wherever it is that you're working. I hope that you can use it and um, show it to your children or um, colleagues and um, yes, use it in whatever way, whether it's, oh, I'm experiencing an, a storm today or I need to let off one of my stress flares today. Um, that's what I'd really hope for it to, to do, to make that accessible for people. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tegan. And thank you again for your honesty and transparency and for all the work that you've done on this. It's been great working with you on it and I know we'll continue to do so. So we've heard from Ben around, you know, in terms of, of rolling things out, um, you know, developing that movement from change. We've heard from Ben about focusing on accelerators. Um, very good point made about the investment case. Uh, obviously, Lynn, Lynn Neagle was on the course earlier. You know, she understands the importance of that. She's a great champion of this work, which is fantastic. We've heard Joe talking about whole systems change uh, and that great challenge uh, and provocation, Joe, to stop tinkering around the edges. Uh, I think that's a really good takeaway point. And that idea, again, reminded from Claire and from, and from Tegan of, you know, we can all do something that bottom up as well as top-down structural approach. But Sophie, uh, we're, we're in the, the final few moments. Uh, I'd like to uh, give you the floor just to perhaps leave us with 
your thoughts in the final couple of minutes, please. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joe, for uh, for highlighting my um, often stroppiness at meetings about the um, the pace of um, change. But then I, you know, it's always worth having an agitator, I think, <laughs> in the in the room. And I think probably there's uh, most of us on this call today are kind of agitators for um, for change in this um, in this area. So, I mean, I, I completely agree, really, with what um, Joe and Claire said um, about this being a kind of there's lots of brilliant practice going on. Um, at a you know a, a, at a, a grassroots level and a practitioner level um and that needs to be kind of scaled up so where we're seeing stuff that works and this is you know the ace hub are doing this brilliantly they're identifying the good practice they're sharing it and so on um and we need to be really kind of embedding then the stuff that works not just as uh, sort of programs pilots because sometimes i think wales has a bit of pilotitis um and we don't kind of scale up and mainstream the stuff that we do well um but actually embedding that in our system so stuff like you know i was talking to um someone from a local authority will remain um nameless this week and they are literally only just getting around to looking at um operation compass which is such a basic thing this is basically about where police um, arrive at homes in the middle of the night because there's been a domestic abuse incident or what have you, that the school, the kids' schools, the teachers are told the following morning so that they know what's gone. And, they, you know, that's just basic, basic stuff. Why is that not happening already across the entire of, of Wales? So we need to get better at kind of scaling um, that stuff up. Um, so I, I sort of feel that there's really good stuff happening on the ground. There's a definite commitment um, at a senior level. And you've seen that, you know, I know how passionate Lynn is about these issues and indeed many people um, at a senior level. But there's this real concrete middle. Um, so, you know, I've often sort of challenged absolutely brilliant that we've got these um you know frontline uh, professionals being ace um, aware and trauma informed but the problem is then um they've identified aces and then if they butt up against a system which isn't responding this concrete middle if you like that's where things start sort of falling down so i think we've got to get at the concrete um, middle. And I think there are opportunities to get at that concrete middle coming up now um, through some of the processes of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So all of the public services boards next year, or well, that we start in this year, will start to develop their new um, wellbeing plans. Now, last time we made a big sort of shift there because 16 of the 19 PSBs in Wales um, had um, ACEs as a priority. And that, you know, that had sort of come from nowhere. That is, you know, testament to the work you've all been doing, Joe and others have been doing um, in the ACE Hub. Um, writing it in, in a document and a plan, however, is one thing. Actually transforming collectively the way they deliver their services is another one. So we now need to be entering into that next phase. So watch this space and get involved in how your local public service board, which contains all of the key public services who need to do stuff in this space, um, how they're sort of responding to this. I'll Before I finish, I'll just say a couple of things then at the sort of top down approach um there's been a lot of discussion around compassion and um you know i've one of the recommendations that i've made to the government is around kindness so kindness compassion i'm sure there are nuances around the the definition but to me they're pretty much the same thing in scotland the scottish government have set kindness as one of the core values of how scotland does public policy and delivers public services now, I think that that's brilliant. And if we all adopted that throughout everything we do, whether that's our professional life or our private life, I think we might be getting towards the sort of trauma informed approach that we're talking about here. Um, I think we need, I've said before, we need to top slice budgets. Um, I think we need to start at a 10 percent top slice. Um, so this is you know, hugely unpopular with probably possibly the health professionals on this call. Let's top slice um, health by 10 percent and let's put that into collective partnership interventions at a local level which will be focused on prevention so that could be improving the quality of our homes it could be really properly embedding and mainstreaming resourcing for the sorts of early intervention models that we're talking about um, and then finally, seek the joined up solutions beyond the obvious. So sometimes, you know, we all talk about needing to get beyond our silos, but sometimes we sort of retreat back into our silos and we end up talking to people who were sort of in our space. But there's loads of connections here. So and the Future Generations Act requires us to think beyond our immediate silos and find these sort of joined up solutions. 
So if I said we've got a system here in the UK where we've got eight and a half million people um, living in food poverty and we've got nine and a half million tons of waste, food waste going to landfill every year, there's that's a system that's mad. And that's a system which is crying out for a solution to say there are ways which locally and nationally we can reduce food waste, which is good for the environment, and we can help to take uh, families out of food um, poverty. If I said that we've got a loneliness and isolation crisis at the moment and the long term trajectory is getting even worse. And yet there are programmes in Wales. Let me tell you about Woofington House, which is an intergenerational schools to care homes. You know, they're doing it in lots of places. But what it's seen there is an improved um, attendance and behaviour of kids who were targeted specifically, probably because they've got ACEs going on at home with a care home, improved attendance and behaviour there and a 50 percent reduction in the use of antipsychotic medication um, in that in that care home. So there are these kind of multiple solutions here. If I told you that we're developing a Valleys Regional Park, working with Natural Resources Wales and a whole range of practitioners there so that we're looking at social prescribing models which are good for people's health how could we start pairing um, some of those things as part of a kind of solution um, to taking trauma-informed approaches and building resilience um, amongst kids so there are things where we can have multiple um, benefits not just in terms of tackling aces but in terms of environmental benefits benefits to our wider community and intergenerational benefits and the future generations act provides that legislative and policy context for us to seek those if we choose to do so. Thank you very much, Sophie. Some great practical things there for us to take away and think about and to lobby, perhaps, uh, in terms of uh, d disassembling that concrete middle that you were talking about. That's another great phrase that uh, I'm, I'm going to take away and, 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 and use. Um, colleagues, we've run out of time. We could be talking about this probably for 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 days, not just hours. It's, it's fantastic, rich discussion. Um, I do want to thank everybody who's joined us on this call. We've had 80 or so people, I think, on the webinar today, which is absolutely fantastic. This will be recorded and we'll make it available for onward sharing. I'd like to thank our panellists, um, Lynn, Neagle, Sophie, Ben, Joe, Claire and Tegan. A huge thank you as well to Vicky and um, Caroline, who joined us earlier. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Nina, Rosie and Stuart, you know who you are, who've been beavering away behind the scenes, making sure that this all works uh, and you've done a fantastic job. So thank you very much indeed. Just um, final couple of words from me. Um, we will be sharing links to the animation to everyone that's joined this conversation. And hopefully you can share that through your channels as well so that we can continue that conversation around how to uh, create a trauma informed society. We are planning a conference in partnership with the 2025 movement and other broader partners uh, and supported by the university through our North Wales Public Service Lab. And again, to continue the, con the conversation, to talk through some of the ideas that we've started to de develop here today. So please look out for those details. And we'll also be continuing to develop our trauma informed approach at the university through our partnership with ACE Hub Wales. Uh, and we look forward to sharing uh, our learning journey with you as it evolves going forwards. Thank you very much indeed, everybody.